Well, good morning, Southeast. It is great to be in the house of the Lord together today and great to have a living water with us. There, hopefully that helps some. So great to be together and to have living water here with us this morning. Our opening scripture on this third Sunday of Advent is found in the Gospel of John. So Gospel of John chapter 1, starting at verse 6, and then we're going to skip on down to verse 19. So Gospel 1 chapter 6. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Now down to verse 19. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. And this all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to be gathered together today in your house. We thank you for all the ways that you gather us here in person, live streaming, Zooming, uh, later on YouTube. Uh, Lord, we trust that in the midst of all the different ways that we meet, you are present and that you are accomplishing your will. We pray that you would move in our midst today, that our focus would be on you, that we would bring all of life to you, and that you would indeed be honored and glorified in our lives. And we pray that you'd have your way. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. So Brother Eddie is going to come and lead us in a few songs, and then Pastor Chris from Living Water is going to come and lead us in our time of prayer. And then we're going to hear from John and Katie. John and Katie, and then we'll have our Advent candles lit, and we'll have the message coming from Isaiah chapter 61. So Brother Eddie and John Mark. Say it again, say go. Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. When I was a seeker, I sought both night and day. I asked the Lord to help me, and he showed me the way. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the that Jesus Christ is born. Say it again, say go. Tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. That Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching over wandering flocks by night, behold from out of heaven has shown a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Say it again, say go. Tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And lo, when they had seen it, they all bowed down and prayed. They all traveled along together to where the babe was laid. Go tell it on the 
Yeah, you can be seated if you're not. Uh, it's really good to be back here. I don't know all of you. My name is Pastor Chris. I'm a uh, pastor of Living Water Church Nazarene. I was associate here for six years, something like that. And it's really good to be back here to see some familiar faces. Just, I don't know, it just brings a lot of joy every time I get to come back to Southeast. I miss you all uh, here. And I miss all of you Living Water people, too, that I don't get to see very much anymore. But um, anyway, it's good to be back here. Uh, I am going to open us in prayer, uh, and so we're going to pray Psalm 126 today. You're welcome to pray along with me if you have your Bibles in front of you. I have an NRSV in front of me here, and uh, then I'm going to lead into a, a time of prayer here. So let's pray. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoice. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Let's continue to pray. God, we thank you for uh, the good news we have in the coming of Christ and the coming kingdom of God. And as we anticipate and await the coming of the kingdom in its fullness, we ask that you would show us signs of it here and now, that we would have that joy beginning to break out in our communities here at Southeast, at Living Water, around San Diego, around the country, and around the world. Uh, we ask that your kingdom would come and that it would come quickly, and we ask that you would prepare us for its coming, that we would be able to release the things that uh, have a hold of us in this world, that we would be set free from sin and darkness and the powers that lay claim to our lives, both in the ways we participate in those things and the ways that those things oppress us. And we pray that you would bind us to one another and to you in all the things that we do as we worship, as we live, as we pray, as we sing, as we celebrate uh, the coming of Christ in this season. God, I lift up all the needs in our communities. There are many, and they can't all be spoken by me now, uh, but God, you know the needs of every person here, every person joining us online around the city and around the country, 
God, we pray that you would hear the cries of your people, that you would know the illnesses that people face, that you would know the difficulties, the lonelinesses, the, uh, the pains, the struggles, and also the joys. God, we trust that you will meet us in the midst of those things, that you'll meet us uh, here in this service as we gather together in this awkward way through screens and all sorts of different uh, combinations, but more in, in the presence of the Spirit that is within us. And God, we pray that you would bind us to one another somehow, help us to know that we're not alone because you're with us and because you've given us each other. God, we pray for healing for those who are sick. We especially pray that you would relieve us from this coronavirus, COVID-19 epidemic. We pray for those who are on the front lines, healthcare workers and hospital workers that are struggling to maintain. We pray that you would keep them safe and healthy, give them energy to do their good work. God, we pray for those who are sick, that you would bring healing, that you would help us to come through this. We pray as vaccines begin to roll out this week, that you would keep us safe as the vaccines come, that you would uh, use this, use the, the knowledge and the science that you've given us to help us recover from uh, this very difficult season that we've all been in. And God, as we try to hold out for the next few months and work our way through what we hope will be the end of this pandemic, we pray that you would help us to be whole and be at peace, that you would help us to not give in to despair and loneliness, that you would help us to uh, just continue putting one foot in front of the other and continue on in faithfulness through a difficult season. God, we pray that you would bless us, that you would bless each person that's here and each person that's uh, here, and that you would uh, continue to lead us deeper and deeper into lives of discipleship together. We pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I think John, John and Katie. All right, John and Katie are going to come and do a song with us. For light, we wait in darkness. Longing for truth, we turn to you. Make us your own, your holy people, light of the world to see. Christ, be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light, shine in your church, gather today. Longing for peace, our world is troubled. Longing for hope, many despair. Your word alone is power to save us, make us your living voice. Christ, be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light, shine in your church, gather today. Longing for food, many are hungry. Longing for water, many still thirst. Make us your bread, broken for others, shed until all are fed. Longing for shelter, many are homeless. Longing for warmth, many are cold. Make us your building, sheltering others, all made of living stone. Christ be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ be our light, shine in your church, gather today. Many the gifts, many the people, 
Many the hearts that yearn to belong. Let us be servants to one another, making your kingdom come. Christ be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ be our light, shine in your church, gather Amen. Thank you. At this time, we're going to have our Advent candles lit. And so asking Rigo and Angela if they'll come. Rigo is going to read scripture for us. Angela is going to light the candles. The scripture is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. And so Rigo, if you'd come and read, and Angela, if you would light. And today is the third Sunday of Advent, and so we get to light the pink candle which is a symbol of the joy that Christ brings. Hello, good morning. How are we doing? Nice to see everybody. Uh, so I'm going to be reading um, verse 16 to 24. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. But test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, just a little bit more about Advent, and then I have a question for you. And I think most of you probably know, but I always enjoy talking about it. Just the symbolism of the Advent wreath and how we have the purple candles, and purple represents the royalty of Jesus, that Jesus is the king. Uh, we light uh, candles so that we recognize that Jesus is the true light that comes into the world, and he is the one who gives us life. Uh, the pink candle symbolizes joy, that Jesus' kingdom is not a rule of tyranny and oppression, but it's a kingdom, a kingdom of joy. Uh, it's an, a, an a evergreen wreath. Uh, that wreath represents the everlasting nature of Jesus' kingdom. His kingdom is not temporary. Uh, it is everlasting. And then it's a made of evergreen, constantly giving life. And so this reminds us of who the true king is and the, the nature of his kingdom, that it's everlasting, that it's joyful, that it's life-giving. And so we, we light this in anticipation. Now, I know that it's easy to kind of fall into the trap of thinking that we're simply anticipating Christmas, that we're lighting the candles as we get closer to Christmas. But we need to remember that Advent season, it's about more than simply Jesus coming at Christmas in a babe in, as a babe in a manger, but it's about anticipation of Jesus coming again, of his return and establishing his kingdom in its fullness. And so we anticipate the coming of Christmas, which we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the birth of King Jesus. But we also anticipate his return in which he establishes his kingdom in fullness. OK, here's my question for you this week. Uh, I want you to take a minute, think about it, talk about it with someone close by. What does the news do to you? Okay, that's the question. What does the news do to you? It can be any news. 
Okay, I'm just saying the news. So what does news do to you? And so think about that for a moment. Talk about it with a neighbor that's close by, and then I'll come on back. What does the news do to you? Okay, well, I can tell from your reactions that the news does something to you. And uh, so let me, let me talk about it just a little bit more before we move to our passage. So I, I kind of couched it with the news, but maybe I should have just said, what does news do to you to at least start with? And so, for example, news does more than inform us. News changes us, does something to us. And so a couple weeks ago, Vonda got news that one of her uncles passed away. And we knew, that th we knew that this was likely coming, but the news came that he passed. And it didn't just inform her that he passed. It did something to her, to where she was, she was brokenhearted. And she was grieving for the loss of her uncle, grieving for her aunt. Uh, and then, of course, it brought back memories of the loss of, of her own dad not so long ago. And so the news did something to her. It wasn't just Vonda got information. It did something to her. Okay, and I'm sure that you all have stories like that to where life was good, your day was going about fine, uh, normal status quo, and you got news, and all of a sudden that news did something to you. And that news might have wrecked your day if it was bad news. If it was good news, you might have been down in the doldrums that day, and that good news came, and all of a sudden you were up on cloud nine for the rest of the day. News does something to us. It doesn't just inform us. It changes us. When I said, what does the news do to you? I heard all kinds of stuff. Uh, Brother Eddie said it makes me want to turn it off, and he does. Okay, and, and I'm guessing that, that whatever you get your news from, and there are all different news sources out there that the news has a tendency either to make us angry or to make us fearful. And oftentimes both, and we go back and forth between fear and anger, fear and anger. Right now we're bombarded with that. We're bombarded with news about COVID-19 creating all kinds of fear. And even what should be quote unquote good news about vaccines, even that gets turned into fear. And then in terms of the different political perspectives, whichever channel you listen to, is trying to create more and more fear about the other side. And so the news isn't just trying to inform us about what's happening. The news is actually trying to do something to us and to make us operate out of fear, to make us operate out of anger, okay, and, and, and to make us sick of it. And sometimes you just got to take a break from the news because I don't know. I don't find much hope and I don't find much peace in the news. But it sure does something to us. Well, then the question kind of becomes, what news are we going to live by? And I know that when I first say that, you might be thinking, oh, I'm going to live by CNN. Or I'm going to live by Fox. Or I'm going to live by KUSI local news. Okay, but what news are we really going to live by? And we are gathered here today because we recognize that the news that we are to live by is the good news of Jesus Christ. Brother Eddie led us in song this morning, Go Tell It on the Mountain, the news that Jesus Christ is born. And so for some news today, I want us to turn to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61 and Isaiah is delivering the news hundreds of years ago. Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation, arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as a soil makes a sprout come up and a garden causes seed to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to be in your presence today. And thank you for your ministry to us already in so many ways. Just the joy that we share because of the news that we have received. And we pray that as we turn our attention to your word, to your news, we pray that you would speak it afresh to us, that you would open our ears to hear you, our hearts to receive you, our minds to be obedient to you. We pray that you would move in our midst and that you would have your way. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Well, just thinking about this Advent season, and we've been working through the Isaiah passages uh, in the lectionary. And a couple weeks ago, the first Sunday of Advent, we were in Isaiah 64, and that opening line, rend the heavens and come down. And just recognizing that we really need God. We need God to come down. We need God to fix things. We need God to make things new. And we need God to make us new. And we recognize that we can't fix ourselves, let alone fix this world. We need God. And so rend the heavens, O God, and come down. And then last week, we were looking at Isaiah 40, and we get this news. Comfort my people. Comfort my people, says your Lord. And that Jerusalem has paid double for all her sins and getting ready to receive the Lord, that the Lord is coming. And so it's like the Lord heard the prayer, rend the heavens and come down. And now we get the news that the Lord is coming. And so get ready for his coming and make a highway in the desert. And we talked a little bit about how that highway would be kind of symbolic of the work of repentance that we need to do. What do we need to do to get ready for the coming of the Lord? What rough places need leveled out? What high places need brought low? What low places need raised up? What do we need to repent from? What do we need to change so that we're ready to receive the Lord? We also talked about how the Lord doesn't leave us to do that work alone, but the Lord actually helps us to repent and to make changes to receive him. Well, today, Isaiah 61 the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, and on it goes. And before we start looking at the text closely, I want us to pause for a moment and think a little bit about Isaiah 61 in context, in its context, and look at some of the language we find here. So chapter 61, he sent me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, freedom for the captives, release from darkness for prisoners, uh, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, that's good news for debtors, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, 
a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So we got poor, brokenhearted, captives, prisoners. We got devastation. We have ruined cities. We have people who are mourning, people who are grieving. And this has been for generations. For generations, grieving, brokenness, things in ruin. And into that, Isaiah is to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, we have been working with this some in terms of their context. And it looks like that Isaiah is speaking into a situation where the city of Jerusalem has been destroyed by the Babylonians. This happened roughly 587 years before Jesus was born. And the Babylonians came and they just totally, totally destroyed Jerusalem and the villages around it and left them in ruins. And they took captive anybody that had status, anybody that had wealth, anybody that had education. And this kind of went on for a little bit till eventually they came and they just destroyed the place. And you may be familiar with Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. They were taken captive by the Babylonians some 20 years before Jerusalem was destroyed. You may know the prophet Ezekiel. He was taken captive some 10, 11 years before Jerusalem was destroyed. So the Babylonians were coming and they were taking people, kind of the best of your people, if you will. Your leadership, the people that you were training and, and thinking that they'll lead us through this. They're taken captive to Babylon. And finally, the vassal king that was on the throne, Zedekiah, he had had enough of Babylon and he rebelled. Well, the truth was Babylon had had enough of him. And they came and they put him to death. They put his sons to death and they just totally destroyed the city and the temple that was there for the Lord. They burned it to the ground and left it in ashes. And people were taken to Babylon into captivity. And there they lived in their captivity and grieving and mourning. And some escaped down to Egypt, and only the poorest of the poor were left there in the devastation. And this is the context that Isaiah is speaking into, a city and villages that are still in ruins from the exile, that they're living in loss, they're living in captivity, and maybe even maybe some of them have been able to come back and their hopes were all up and they get back and they see how devastated everything is, how broken and ruined, and it just becomes hopeless again. And I don't know if you can relate to that or not, but just a time of living in ruin. And it just seems like you can't escape it, that you're living in loss, that you're living in brokenness. You know, and, and small losses, we kind of get through them. You know, we might know, we, we might realize, okay, we're going to go through a rough patch, but we're going to get through this, and we come out the other side, and we're no longer living in that. But this has been going on for years, that if, if we look at it historically, you know, the Babylonians started kind of, what, taking people into captivity sometime around 609 thereabouts, and then 598 and 587, what are we talking, 20, 30 years now? And then finally, the Babylonians get defeated in 539 by the king of Persia. And that seems like good news and people are going to get to go home, but they go home to what? They go home to devastation and to ruins and realize that everything that their family had worked for for generations, it's all a loss. See, this isn't just kind of bad news. You get through it in a weekend. This is ruins for decades. And, and this is what Isaiah is kind of speaking into and speaking this good news into this situation of loss, this situation of ruins, this situation of living in grief. Maybe it's you. Maybe you just know someone living in grief. It's like you never are able to work your way through it and out the other side. That you are just stuck in the ruins, stuck in the grief. That's where they were. And Isaiah has this news that he is speaking into them. And he really does expect this news to change them. And so listen to it again, verse, chapter 61, verse 1. The context, we kind of feel this loss, this devastation, this ruins for decades. The spirit 
of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Wow. What news. I, I want to talk about it in a couple ways. So the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Who is the me? And then I also want us to identify specifically kind of the mission. So we got the me and we got the mission. And I guess at one level we could say the me is Isaiah. He's the one speaking. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's the one delivering this good news. Isaiah is certainly spirit empowered. And so at one level we could say Isaiah is talking about himself. The spirit of the Lord is upon me and I'm here to give you this good news. Okay, but I think maybe more is going on than that. So if we look back a few places in Isaiah, let's go all the way back to chapter 9 of Isaiah. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. These are familiar passages and if you know Isaiah. But Isaiah chapter 9, and we'll pick it up at verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forevermore. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Look with me over to chapter 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom, of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. And on it goes how righteousness will be his belt, and there will be this age of peace. Look with me forward to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. Now, I don't know if you're picking up on all this, but what Isaiah is anticipating, what he's prophesying, is that the Lord is going to raise up a new son of David, a new king, and that the Lord is going to equip that king with his very spirit so that the me... The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's not just Isaiah talking about himself. It's Isaiah making reference to this king. 
this king that God is going to raise up from the line of David, that is going to bring justice, that is going to bring peace, that is going to make things right and establish God's rule, God's righteousness on the face of the earth. That Isaiah is anticipating that and announcing that. In fact, do you know what he's doing in chapter 61? I think what he's doing is he is speech writing. You know how it is in our day. Presidents never write their own speeches. They have somebody else writing a speech for them. And their speech writers might have a whole slew of speeches ready for whatever occasion might happen. They might have a speech ready for victory. They might have a speech ready for defeat. They might have a speech ready if the economy's going good, a speech ready if it's going bad. The, the, the presidents all have speech writers. We hardly know what they say or think. We just get a heavy dose of speech writers. Isaiah, probably not good to say this, but he's playing speech writer. He is an inspired speech writer. And the Lord has given him the words that this king is going to announce. Now, bear in mind, Isaiah doesn't know when this king is coming. But Isaiah knows what the message is going to be. Isaiah doesn't know how long he or his people after him are going to have to wait for this king. But he knows this king is coming, and he knows what God is doing with this king and what God desires to do through this king. And so by the power of the Spirit, Isaiah is able to write a speech. I don't know if you want to call it an inaugural speech, but he is able to write the speech. And the hope of it is so real that Isaiah is able to speak or write as if it already is. When Isaiah is living, this king hadn't been born yet, but he knows, he's heard from above, that God is going to raise up this son of David to bring this justice and to bring this peace. And so he's got the speech ready for him when he takes office. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor. Now, I know what many of you are already thinking. Jesus quotes this. In fact, if you want to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 4, you can read right where Jesus quotes this passage. Luke chapter 4, verse 16, Jesus is in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. Verse 16, Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow. Isaiah was a speechwriter for Jesus. That Jesus read that and announced it to everybody that today it's fulfilled in your hearing. It is a time of good news for the poor. It is a time of healing for the brokenhearted, of release for prisoners and captives. And Jesus is saying it's fulfilled in me. I'm the me that Isaiah was talking about. I'm the me that Isaiah was writing this speech for. Jesus is that king. Mission. The mission is a mission of good news. It's a mission of preaching. It's a mission of healing, of preaching good news to the poor, that debts are covered, that they're paid for, of announcing the year of the Lord's favor. And the year of the Lord's favor meant that it was going to be a time of debt release and that they were to release debt to each other and they were to set slaves free and they were to have their land returned to them and return to their land and basically God showing them favor. And so the year of the Lord's favor, a time of, of, of liberation, 
As Isaiah anticipated it, this would also happen simultaneously with the vindication of God, that God would pay back all those who had oppressed Israel across the centuries. And so this time of vindication, it's interesting that when Jesus quotes Isaiah, he stops before that point. That Jesus says it's the year of the Lord's favor and he folds it up and sits down. That it's not the time of vindication yet. It's not payback time. It's not vengeance time. It's just simply a time to keep announcing the time of God's favor and goodness. Look, else, look at the rest of the mission. To provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair that this news is going to transform and bring healing. And where there's such brokenness and such loss and such grief, there's going to be fullness and there's going to be joy. And to me, the most fascinating part about it is verse 4. I'm sorry, the end of verse 3. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Okay, I don't know what you think of when you think of oak trees. But when I think of oak trees, I think of these really strong, beautiful trees. And they're, they're, they're massive and they're strong and, and the birds nest in them. And you got squirrels running around in them and the oak trees are a source of food for the squirrels. And the oak trees are big enough and strong enough that they become a place of shelter. That you can find rest in their shade. And if it's a downpour, you might even be able to stay a little bit dry under an oak tree. And so these oak trees are these, these beautiful trees that not only do they kind of have life in themselves, but they also provide life for others in terms of a place to nest, in terms of a source of food, in terms of shelter, in the midst of heavy heat or even a storm. And what I find fascinating is that in the ministry of this king, those who are broken, those who are poor, those who have been oppressed and downtrodden and have been living in ruins, they are transformed to where they become oaks of righteousness. And I think about that, oaks of righteousness. And I, I think that there's a few ways that we need to think about this and understand this. Oaks of righteousness. How did they become oaks when they were so beaten and downtrodden and broken and in grief? How did they become oaks? Through the right doing of the Lord. Oaks of righteousness, oaks of God doing right by them and rescuing them in their brokenness and seeing how downtrodden they were and how they were stuck. God said, I, I, I'm not going to allow that to go on. That in due time, I got the solution. I'm sending my servant king, my son, and raising him up, and he will transform these people into oaks of righteousness. And so they become oaks not by their own doing. They become oaks by the right doing of God. And God intervenes and acts on their behalf out of faithfulness to them and God's own character and God's covenant and transforms them into oaks. Oaks of righteousness, oaks of the right doing of God. But I also think about it as a se in a second way. Oaks of righteousness in terms of, well, what kind of oak trees are they? Righteous oak trees. What kind of oak trees are they? Well, they're, you know, you got all kinds of different oak trees, I assume. These oak trees, you know, they're, they're oaks of righteousness. That's characteristic of them. And so that kind of presses me into maybe a little bit of third way. They are oaks that do right. They're oaks of righteousness because God has made them right, but they're also, and God, and God has done right by saving them or raising them up and transforming them. But the result of that is that they are oak trees who practice righteousness who do right. You know, what, what kind of nuts are produced on a righteous oak tree? You know the answer. Righteous ones. Okay, and so these are, these are oaks of righteousness because they do right things. 
in terms of honoring God, in terms of doing right by each other. And so the work of, the, the work of this king, this spirit-anointed king, is to come and announce good news to the poor and, and freedom to the captives and release of those who are stuck in darkness and transform their lives. So that instead of being somebody that is trapped in mourning and grieving, they're actually raised up and transformed to where they are an oak of righteousness. And it becomes evident to everyone, wow, look at God. God has done them right and transformed them. And so that they become a display of the splendor of God. Okay, are you, are you tracking with me? And so, so we have this, this vision in terms of the me and in terms of the mission. Now, we need to go a little bit further. What are these oak trees going to do? These oak trees, look, verse 4, they. Who's the they? The they is these oak trees. These, these people that were so depressed, so oppressed, in such despair and darkness, these people that God has transformed through this anointed king and become this, this, these oaks of righteousness, what are they going to do? Verse 4, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Aliens will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord, and you will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance, and so they will inherit a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. Now let me try to summarize that really quickly for you. First of all, what these oaks are going to do is they are going to rebuild the devastated cities. They're not going to just be strong for themselves. Their lives have been transformed, and they become these oaks of righteousness so that they can engage the brokenness around them and that they can begin to rebuild the cities and the villages that have been left un uninhabited and left in ruins. See, they're not just transformed so they can be beautiful trees. They're transformed so that they can get to work, become transforming agents themselves by the power of the Spirit, and so that all that was in ruins begins to be renewed through their activities. And, and then, not only is that, but these oaks, they're going to be priests. They will be a priestly kingdom in the world, and this goes back to the whole mission for the people of Israel that they'll be God's covenant people, that they'll be a holy nation, that they'll be a kingdom of priests. And what do priests do? Well, priests are to pray on behalf of others. Priests are to be a conduit of God's blessings to others. And priests are to teach the ways of God. So here you have this broken people that's been renewed, that's been transformed, that's been made into oaks of righteousness. And what do they do? They are to get to work rebuilding what has been ruined, and they are to function in the world as priests so that they are praying for others and that God's blessings are flowing through them to others and that they are making, way the, making known the ways of God. And all of this is rooted in the very heart of God. The Lord says, I love justice. And so this new day is coming out of God's very heart, God's very character, God is determined to bring this about because of who God is. Look with me at the end of the chapter. Stay with me. I think we have the king speaking again. Verse 10. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes a sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. The Lord is going to do this through the king. The Lord is going to do this through the oaks of righteousness that come about 
as a result of the king's ministry. Now, let's jump forward. I've already mentioned Luke chapter 4, 16 to 21, where this is fulfilled in Jesus. Okay, but you know and I know that it's partially fulfilled in Jesus, that it hasn't yet been fully fulfilled in Jesus. That we still live in a world where there's a lot of brokenness, a lot of hurt, a lot of wrong, a lot of injustice. You just watch the news, fear and anger. But we also know that Jesus has come. And we celebrate that at Christmas. And we know that he was sent on mission to be the servant king, to die on the cross for our sins, that we could be reconciled to God, that we could have peace. We know that we have his spirit, that as he ascended, he gave us his spirit so that we could continue on in his ministry and that we could continue to be transformed and directed towards him and reminded of the news that he reigns. See, we stand, we stand historically at least, in a better place than Isaiah and his people. Isaiah and his people, they get this news and they're waiting. They get this news that a king is going to be born and God's spirit is going to be upon him. And they're just waiting. But this news for Isaiah and his people is to be so real, so strong, so matter of fact, that it does something to them and that it changes them. And so that even though their circumstances may not yet be changed, that news changes them in the midst of their circumstances. And they become a people of hope and a people of righteousness because they know God is going to do them right. And they know that God is going to bring healing to them. And so they can begin the building projects already, if you will, in terms of starting to pick the pieces up because they have the energy that hope gives, that the news gives, that a king is going to be born. See, we're in a better place than that because we know that the king has already been born. And we know that the king did way more than most of the people of Isaiah's day ever expected. That this king went to the cross and gave himself for us. That we could have peace with God. And this king didn't just have the spirit of the Lord upon him. But through this king and his death and his resurrection, that very spirit, the spirit of the Lord, is given to each and every one of us who call upon his name. And so as oaks of righteousness, we discover that we're not working on our own, that the news has so changed us that we don't just work on our own, but we've actually received the gift of his spirit. And so that we are a people that are transformed into oaks of righteousness for the display of his splendor. We are that people that is to engage in rebuilding and restoring the ruined cities. And I, I know what most of you are thinking. When you hear ruined cities, you think about the worst part of our cities. And you might think about the worst part of the cities across our country. You might think about the worst parts of the cities around the world. And, and I don't want to diminish that. But I also want to be sure that somehow we don't just draw a line between the cities and the villages of Jerusalem and around Jerusalem, draw a line straight, straight from there to the United States and our cities. Do you know what the straighter line would be? The straighter line would be to our churches, people of God. See, Jerusalem and the cities around it, they weren't just a nation state among nation states, like the U.S. is a nation state among nation states. That nation state was really a religious state. It was the people of God. And so when I begin to think about Israel as the people of God, and I think about us and how we apply this to us, it's not simply the rebuilding of ancient ruins and ancient cities. Maybe it's a rebuilding of the church. The rebuilding, the revitalization, the revival of churches that are without heart 
of churches that have been living according to the news on Fox or CNN or Facebook news or whatnot, then maybe what needs to happen is that the churches around the globe and across our country, maybe we need to make sure that we're living by the news of what God has done in Jesus. That that is the news that gives us life, that that is the news that transforms us into oaks of righteousness. And as an oak of righteousness, then we begin to get busy in the places where God has planted us. Again, I keep thinking about oak trees. Oak trees, places of rest, the birds finding rest and shelter. And so what if, what if we're an oak tree here? What if living water is an oak tree down on Marcus Street? And so that people who are hurting and broken can find rest in our branches because of who the Lord has made us, how he's equipped us with his spirit. What if we are an oak tree on this corner, living water down on Marcus Street, and we become a source of food, that we become a source of, of spiritual food, that people are able to come and in our midst be fed in their souls with this news that they're not going to get anywhere else. So that in the midst of whatever circumstances they find themselves in, well, as we heard Paul write, that you constantly rejoice and that you're always giving thanks because you know the news of what God has done and that God will be faithful to continue to perfect that news. The Lord is faithful. He will do it. He will sanctify us through and through. And maybe we're just a place where hurting people can find some relief, you know, some shade or some shelter. But what if, what if we begin to re-envision ourselves as oak trees that the Lord has planted all across the face of the earth, and in particular on this corner, down on Marcus Street, oak trees that the Lord has planted through the work of the servant King Jesus and transformed us because we are all broken, we're all needy, none of us are righteous and in of our, of our own, but the Lord has done us right and is changing us so that we can be characterized as oaks of righteousness. Well, that's my prayer for us. That's what I'm really trusting will happen, that as we hear this news, that it's going to do something to us. God's going to do something to us through this news and that we become a testimony, a sign that this news is true, that this king has come and that this king is returning to establish his reign in fullness. And in the meantime, by the power of his spirit, we are being transformed into a forest of righteous oak trees for God's glory. The Lord is faithful, and he will do it. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Well, we, we forget, we get caught up in so much news that's not really coming from you. And sometimes we find ourselves just being co-opted by the news. And sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's anger. Sometimes we just want to shut it off and put our head in a hole and act like well, there's no news. We're so grateful today for the good news. The good news of Jesus, our King, our Savior, who came and who is coming. We thank you that not only did you anoint Jesus with your spirit, but that you did such a work in him and through him that now you give us that spirit, his spirit. Not that we're king, but that we're empowered by your spirit to live under his reign even now as we anticipate his coming. We pray that you would continue your good work of transforming us into oaks of righteousness individually as well as collectively as congregations. And we pray that you would help us to live in the hope 
and the joy of this news over against all the other news we're confronted with. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And Brother Eddie, would you come and would you lead us in joy to the world? And John Mark, if you want to come, John. And now may the grace and joy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless. Thank you for being here. Have a great week. And may the Spirit continue to transform you into an oak of righteousness. God bless.